podcast listeners. This is another episode of Nobody Asked Us with Des and Kara. Des Linden here, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kara Goucher. How's it going, Kara? Good, Des. How are you? Great intro per use. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read my note card, so I felt pretty good about it. Um, what's new? I feel like we should do a brief catching up before I tell you what the theme for the week is. What's new? I don't know. I just... I, I can't imagine. Bookland. I am in Bookland. And that's what I was about to say. I can't imagine where you are because I feel very stressed, not in a bad way, but just so many interviews and things getting ready for the book launch. And you're also doing that, but you're also training for a marathon. So I don't know how you're doing all of that. How are you doing all of that? I'm just not thinking about it. I think that's, um, you know, the the best thing to do just day by day. <laughs> You have a lot of appearances before the marathon. How are you feeling about yeah. that? That's going to be hard, but um, I think it's actually, it's great when you have an appearance that's just one event and it's like maybe two hours max because I'll have all day to, I imagine, go run and then relax and then just be on for a couple hours. So I think it'll be manageable, but the travel will be tough, but it's all pretty, pretty close. We were pretty strategic about it. Cool. I feel like you well, did that question. I was like, what's going on with you? And then you- <laughs> um, what is going on with me? I saw a new neurological PT this week that I'm really excited about. Um, and yeah, basically I'm just trying to it was good. She had so with this dystonia, it's like your brain wires get crossed. So I do a lot of strength training and stuff, but unless you, you know, her theory is unless you attack the brain and do these like simple exercises that seem crazy, like an app where it shows you a left foot and then a right foot. And you have to say if it's left or right really quickly. Um, She feels like I could help rewire my brain a little bit. So I don't know. I've only been once and I've only been doing my exercises for a day, but I'm excited about where it might take me. Yeah. I have a really weird question and humor me, but have, has anybody (laughs) um, talked about mushrooms? Like psychedelic mushrooms? Okay. Have you read yes. Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind? I have not. You, it's crazy. It's wild. Um, check it out if you are interested in that sort of thing. But go tell yeah. me about. I have heard about the mushrooms from a few different people, actually. Um, and I'm not opposed to it. But I also, when I sort of shared my diagnosis with everybody, I got hundreds of suggestions. Yeah. And <laughs> And that's great, right? But I also felt like I need to work through everything slowly because I, I, if something in, enhances my health or makes my leg better, function better, I need to know what it was that did it. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm kind of at this place where nothing's off the table. Like I would even consider getting a deep brain implant uh, potentially if my dystonia got worse. But I want to try all these other things and see if I can get to a place. I mean, It'll be interesting when you're done competing, how much you want to run. For me, I would love to be able to run like 60 miles a week, which is just unrealistic at this point. But I mean, I ran 40 miles last week. So that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm having some success. But um, yeah, obviously, that's something if I don't get any better or if I were to get worse, that's something that I would consider trying. So there yeah, you go. I, that's great. <laughs> um, how about make a party out of it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That'd um, be great. <laughs> Want to come? Right. Well, I uh, I'm still competing, so I you know what? Yeah. They're actually not not that I've looked this up, but they're not on the band list, so I guess I could. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, wait till you're done, just to be sure. Yeah. So yeah, if we do it, we could do a podcast, and we could. Um, this is where our YouTube channel would be amazing <laughs> because we I mean, are on YouTube. Totally now. blow up. <laughs> uh, I'm not condoning mushrooms, but. I am condoning that you check out the YouTube version of our podcast because I think it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the big seller for us. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think today we we do want to talk about something we've both had in our life goals and we're both able to accomplish and then now both have mixed feelings about, and that is the Olympics. The, I When I was in high school, I went to a camp and they called it the Big O. I was like, I don't oh, really? Know that's the, the best, I don't know if that's. How do we think that one? Yeah, like, yeah. Could make yeah. It a big O. It's funny because we've both experienced the Olympics twice, and of course, it was. 
I mean, for me, it was the biggest goal that I ever accomplished was making an Olympic team. But I, it wasn't necessarily everything that I dreamed it would be. And so I thought, you know, a lot of people were asking us to talk about the Olympics. So we thought, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be really great because, like you said, everyone puts it on a pedestal and it's like, this is the one time the world watches our sport and it's glamorous and it's all of these things and kids are inspired but there's this totally different side that as soon as the as the lights go off you don't even like you just don't hear about it and it's it's a different element so um yeah. it'll be fun to dig into that so let's yeah, just let's start with um how long how long did it take you to qualify like i guess when did the seed get planted like when we're like hey this is something i want to do and then how long did it take to achieve the dream i think i was like a lot of kids that i wanted to be an olympian i remember i had my mom tape a uh balance beam like the size of it and the length of it on her floor in the playroom so i would imagine myself you know at the olympics but i was such a horrific gym gymnast and actually i'm i'm not very athletic uh at all like my stepbrother used to make his like make fun of me and throw a ball at me and it would hit me and then my hand would go up to catch it. So obviously <laughs> gymnastics was not going to um, happen for me, but I just was obsessed with the idea. And I think I really gravitated towards track and field. And we've talked a little bit about this. I thought it was going to be a sprinter at first. Um, but when I really was like, I'm going to the Olympics was in 92 after I saw Lynn Jennings win the bronze medal in the 10,000. So that was really the moment where I was like, I'm going to make this happen. And so that was 92 and I didn't, I made my first Olympic team in 2008. So, you know, it took a while to get there. Um, how, and it was my how many, third, go ahead. it was my third Olympic trials when I finally got it, got the job done. That was my yeah. question. What, what events did you, what events was it? And did you just do the one or did you kind of start expanding? Yeah, I did. Like, so in like, what events did I run at the Olympic trials? Yeah. yeah. I ran the 5,000 in the 2000 trials. I finished eighth in the final. And, you know, that year, because of Regina Jacobs winning and then pulling out and then and then um, Dina doubled or she had made it in the 10 and the five and she ended up just running the 10, uh, fifth place went. And so I thought about that for a long time because I wasn't that far off of fifth place. So I thought, oh, well, in 04, you know, I was still in college. I was like, well, in 04, when I've graduated from college and I'm a professional, of course I'm going to make it. And I barely qualified for the trials that year in the 5,000 again. And then I was the only person kicked out. I, the field was significantly smaller in 2004. And I was the only person in my heat that did not move on to the final. So that was very humbling. And then, yeah, but it was still the goal. And I still you know, even though all signs were don't keep trying, I just kept trying. And then I finally made it in 08 in the 5,000 and in the 10,000. And for you, you've talked about this a little bit, but your first was your first Olympic trials were 08 in the marathon. Yes. Yep. That was, um, that was my second marathon ever. And I just, I had like a great build and I was like, I'm making, I'm going to make the team. Like I was super confident. And then at, I think mile 22 or 23, the wheels fell off the way they can in a marathon. And I was like, oh, this is, I might not finish. I might not even be able to get to the end of this race. How uh, humbling. But it was a moment where I was like, I'm going to figure this event out and I'm never going to hit the wall again. And um, I'm going to be better at the last 10K than anybody. So it made me hungry. Every time I hear you talk about the 08 Olympic trials, I love how you were like, I'm getting on this team. I'm sorry, but no one knew who you were. And you're yeah. like, I am making this freaking team. And then you're, you're devastated when it didn't happen. I love every time you tell that story, because from the outside, it seems like, well, why did you think <laughs> you were going to make it? But you really felt like you could. When did you first, like, obviously you heard about the Olympics as a kid, but when was the first time you were like, I'm making an Olympic team. That is my goal. It was a high school camp where they called it the Big O. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was for like elite high schoolers. And I actually wasn't good enough to be in the camp, but 
I was local. So they're like, well, you're close enough. Why don't you come out? And um, they did all these classes and you are at the Olympic Training Center. And so it felt like you're part of something special. Um, we did, I think Lauren talked about this in her book. I think it was the same camp. So it was this very elite group of high schoolers and we did VO2 max testing. And at the time, my uh, VO2 max was two standard deviations above the mean of this elite camp. So it was like, a really eye-opening moment where I'm like, I like talented. There's like something here that suggests like I'm pretty, pretty good. And I don't know, maybe it was like placebo and everyone got the same paper. <laughs> but I was like, I think that there's, you know, like potential. Um, and that's when I started really believing like maybe one day. Uh, and then it kind of uh, ebbed and flowed in, in college where I didn't take it as seriously i don't think but once i became a pro and it was like okay um this is my gig now this is what i'm doing besides my moose jaw career um and i would like to move on from my moose jaw career so i think of you every time i see one we have one in boulder and every time i drive by there now i'm like des linden worked there <laughs> that's right it's like you know the guy who started it started they're brilliant they started uh do you remember crowd rise they did yeah. the fundraising yeah so they started crowd rise and they got bought out by GoFundMe. They started Mooshja, who got bought out by Walmart. I don't know what they're on next, but they're just phenomenal businessmen. Little side note for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Olympics of yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about more that. We'll get to stuff like that. But when you finally qualified, finally, it only took you two tries, but you know, you have talked about how you imagined the flag and the moment. Was it everything that you dreamed it was going to be in that moment? It, it really was. There's not too many moments in the sport where they live up to the hype. Um, I think the crushing defeat of 2008 after believing, um, figuring out the event. And then I ran in the, the I think I ran the 10K at the 2008 track trials um oh, I, remember being, I think I, I remember being lapped by amy bagley i was like she's gonna get the standard like <laughs> she's just ripping right i was like do i like help her for as long as possible as i was getting lapped i'm like just stay out of the way um so i did do that <laughs> and then yeah when i made it in 12 it was one of the highs of my career for sure just like making that first team realizing a dream um knowing that that little bit of crazy that you believed in is validated, justified. I think, um, yeah, it was super cool. How about you? Yeah. Similar. I, my, the, the first race where I actually became Olympian was that 10,000. And I remember I was training with Amy at the time. She was my training partner and she had had a hell of a time. She had trained so hard, but our coach at the time was just so mean to her. And she knew that I was going to take the lead around 1200 meters, but I wasn't going to take the lead before that. And I remember her taking the lead and pushing the pace. And then with three laps to go, I took the lead. And then I remember with maybe a lap to go, Shalane went by me and I just didn't care because I knew I like lost all competitive juice. I yeah. was like, all I have to do is stay on my feet for this next lap right. and I'm going to the Olympics, you know? And I finished and I made it and I was crying and my family was there. And then I didn't know if Amy had hit the mark or not. And I remember my mom was like talk hugging me and crying. She's like, go hug Amy. So I went back and then she was like, I made it. And I was like, what? So it actually made that experience even better because this was a person that I admired that I knew how hard she had worked. I had done every single workout with her, you know? So it, it made that it made it really special. And I was on cloud nine for sure. It was complicated because my husband, Adam, was also trying to make the team. And so he didn't end up making it. So those trials were kind of a mixed bag of emotions of, I, I made my first Olympic team. Then later in the meet, I won the 5,000. That was my first US title. Um, and just seemed like, oh my God, everything I ever jumped up was coming true. But one of my big dreams was going to the Olympics with Adam and that didn't happen. So it was kind of like, yay, sad, yay, sad, but mostly... I can't believe this is happening. I I got it done. And Adam made a team at a trials where you missed as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so reverse yeah. was true. Yeah. Was, I think yeah. this was harder for him just because 
he had been there and I was so young. I was so jealous when Adam made the team in 2000, but I was so proud of him. And so I remember crying in the shower so he wouldn't hear me, you know, <laughs> um, and cause I didn't want to take away from his huge moment, but I definitely was wishing that I was going to Sydney with him, of course. So I think eight years later, he had worked so hard to come back from a lot of injuries and he had just worked so incredibly hard. And I felt like if there's any justice in this world, he's going to make this team. And he didn't. And it was really sad. And it was really hard. And yeah, so it was all sorts of emotions, like the happiest I've ever felt in my life. Like, and then also, oh my gosh, I'm so sad. And I feel so sad that he's devastated. That's such a tough balance. And just like that support team at times you set aside your own thing for somebody else. And then, yeah, so that's, would be a really hard dynamic. I think that's a thing with being on teams too, where you see the same thing with your teammates and yeah, uh, it's, that's tough. But I, I thought it was interesting that you said you preserved second because that's such a different experience from any other race. And just talk about a little of the pressure of the trials and, you know, I, to me, that was always harder than the games. So for maybe sure, just want to see that up. Yeah. So obviously it's top three go. And so it doesn't matter if you got food poisoning. It doesn't matter if you're a minute faster than everyone else in the 10K or five minutes faster than everyone else in the marathon. If you have a slightly off day or if someone is having an incredible day and they get in front of you, it's just over. There is no do over. And so I think I knew in 08, like I knew in 12, well, 12, I was much more nervous. Um, but in 08, I knew there's not more than one person that can beat me. And it was really like, just don't do anything stupid and get the job done. Once I made the team in the 10K, I was actually able to take some more risks in the 5K because I felt like I'm on the team. I'm on the team. There's no way I'm not flying to Beijing, but now I have a chance to, to risk a little, gamble a little and see if I can win something. So there's so much pressure on that day and it's so intense. And it doesn't matter how fit you are or how much you know you believe or you belong on that team, you have to execute. And how was that for you in 2012? Did you feel a ton of pressure? I mean, you you were in great shape. You were running so well. You were coming off of getting second at the Boston Marathon the year before. Everyone expected you to make it, but then you still have to go out there and do it. Yeah. I, that was a big shift. I think, you know, the, the really great run in Boston was a lot easier because people were like, what the hell is she talking about? You know? Um, <laughs> and then I, I did it. I had a really great run and people were like, Oh, well, what can she do next? And obviously the next big thing, big, big thing was the Olympics is like, you got, you have to get on the team. Um, so there was definitely a mental shift in the build up to that super interesting. Cause it's the biggest sports story of, you know, for, for our sport, um, for marathons and, it just gets bigger from there. So it was good in terms of like managing that and understanding like what the media would be like and prepping for that sort of thing. Cause it was like a little taste, um, for what came after, but it was, it was different. And it was also different racing where, you know, there was a group of four or five of us and you're like, okay, let me have to do a little bit more work. Like we got to get our solidify our crew and whoever's in that three, um, maybe we work together or maybe we're just like listening to the people on the side of the road who are like, I remember at a certain point it was like, you guys are going to, to London. And it was like, okay, I don't know what the gap is, but like, that's a pretty good sign. And you could hear the cheers like, okay, there's one, two, there's two people there or someone, someone else has dropped. So, you, you know, you do feel very different. Like I've locked in the thing and you just preserve your spot at that point. But yeah, that, that build up oh, yeah. was different where I was expected. Yes, you were expected. And that was a crazy race because it came down to four of us. And then we headed out on that last loop together and there were still four of us. And I remember I was, I was hanging on because I had had a pretty serious injury. I was getting my ass kicked every day by Shalane. I, I didn't finish one complete workout, not one that she did. And so I was just, I was on this edge. Um, but then Amy started to fall back a little. And I started to tell myself, like, just fake it. Just go up there with Des and Shalane and stay there and just fake it till it breaks her will, essentially. Remember we had that little, we called it a popsicle, this little like mm -hmm. total 
turn, this random thing we'd run down and then turn right back around and come back down the road. And we got through that and I was hanging on to you guys, hanging on to you guys. And we did that. And then I could see where Amy was. And then I just took a, a deep breath and was like, Bye guys. All I have to do again <laughs> is keep my composure and I'm going. I'm going I'm making this team and it is so different than other races where I mean of course you want to win. Of course I would have loved it if you guys had a bad day and I got to be Olympic trials champion, but I really just needed to be in that top 3 and it's a very different mental shift from when you're running Boston or whatever and you're trying to win versus I don't want to I just want to not make any stupid mistakes and get through. Yeah. You have to, what is it? Survive in advance. That's, that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. I love it. So you make the team, you've made a few teams now. Uh, what is, what's different? I mean, are you an Olympian? What's the buildup like in terms of preparation? Is it find out how fit you can get and where that places you or get really fit and swing for the fences? Like how is that different than any other race? Yeah, I think I had two different experiences. When I was competing on the track, we really looked at the history of the event and it tended to be a very tactical effort. And so we worked more on strength with kick speed. And of course, I went to the Olympic Games and my heart was just blown apart because it was not sit and kick at all. It was like the first lap, you know, was at, I think we came through the 5K at, um, I want to say 15.0 something or 15.15, which was not at all what I was expecting. Um, and then I think when I qualified for London, I I overtrained. I think my team, I'm not mad. I think we thought this is what you have to do to get a medal and we're going to do everything we can. We were, we were reading about workouts other athletes were doing. We were copying them. And, you know, I got to London. I was completely fried. I was just like, I just want this race to be over. So yeah, they were they were both different. How was it for you? I mean, I feel like you trained really hard both times to give yourself a shot. What was that prep like for you? Yeah, being fried is relatable. <laughs> um, yeah, for London, it was strange. Like I never really got into a great rhythm with training. I feel like I was I felt like I was always nursing something or just running a little bit inhibited by something and it just, you know, I was forcing. I feel like that's when I've always struggled struggled in my career is when I'm like trying to force something instead of just running where I'm at and hoping to gain fitness. But um, it ended up being like way, way more mechanical. And yeah, I think that in the build, if it had gone perfectly, it still would have been swing for the fences. Like no one wants to go to the games and I don't know, finish 15th and be like, well, yeah, that was pretty solid. It's like, I'd rather try to be on the podium and finish 37th, you know, and instead of just run in the mix and see where I land. So that was the mentality. And then same thing in Rio, for sure. I think in Rio, it was in the back of my mind, like, I cannot get her. That's like not an option. So there's an element of did I leave time on the table being conservative? Um, I don't think I did. If I, if I did, it wasn't much. And and frankly, it wouldn't have mattered because <laughs> I was so far off the front. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, and I think if I were to make it again, I would do the exact same thing. I think it's just a place where you, you go and you try to podium. And, and that's the only way, and maybe you'll disagree with this, we could chat about it, but I feel like that's the only way if you're really a competitive athlete that you can say you had a successful Olympics. Yeah. I think one thing people don't understand, I definitely didn't understand this was I got to the Olympics and I ran a personal best in the 10,000, but I was ninth. I ran a good race in the, no, I, I, well, I think I ended up, well, it doesn't matter. Um, I ran a very good tactical effort in the 5,000, but I ended up ninth, which I think now is 10th or now is eighth. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, but there was so much hype ahead of time and so much media and so much hope. And I had never seen myself in so many articles and stuff before. And then when you're walking through the media afterwards, it's kind of like, well, good try. 
they don't want to talk to you because the focus is on the medalists. And I think that's something that is always, I don't want to say like a bad taste in my mouth, but it, it made me walk away both times feeling like I really failed. And that, you know, I wanted to ask you, well, actually, I want to know your experience first before I tell you this, ask this other thing. So yeah, what was it like for you? Did you feel a lot of pressure building up to it, a lot of attention? And then what was it like when you were actually there after the race and facing the media? Yeah, it was definitely another bump in like expectations. I think first Olympic team, the Boston race went so well. Um, and I think all of us were saying we're, we're going to medal. We want to compete with the best in the world. We're trying to take what Dina did and at least stay in the same range or try to move it up a notch. And I feel like our generation was always really pushing for that. Um, and we all, I think we really all raised the bar for each other. Um, what I found fascinating was that the moment you make the team, everyone it's like, you're an Olympian. This is so exciting. And they begin to market and brand as you are an Olympian and everyone wants to put that in headlines and wants to, you know, take your time to get their article, get their story, whatever it is. Um, and so that to me was always like an eye-opening moment where uh, when I had my injury and I was like, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass and not take the spot, like who's the alternate? And they're like, well, you you won't be in an Olympian. Like you will not be an Olympian if you don't start the race. And it's like, it's really crazy because you've done all this marketing. Um, prior and all of like, I don't know, it's like an NIL thing where you're like, okay, so you, you've you used a lot of my time for this and now I don't even get a title. Like I don't know, <laughs> I'm going to at least start. Um, so that was part of it too. But yeah, it's a whole different beast and it's just very time consuming and you're aware that it's different and that the expectations on race day are going to be different. Yeah. I felt for my first race at the Olympics was the 10,000 meters in 08. And I was so overwhelmed by all of it. Just the scale of it, the stadium, you know, we walked into the stadium and there's more people in the stadium than live in my hometown, you know? That's and wild. I'm like trying to hear my mom, like thinking I'm going to hear my mom in there. <laughs> I did not hear my mom. Um, <laughs> I just felt really, um, like I didn't belong there. Like I actually was thinking like, how did I get here? How did I trick all these people into thinking I deserve to be here, you know? And so it was, it was a tough experience. I think I was grateful that I had the 5K because I was able to regroup a little bit and say, okay, go, you deserve to be here. Go out there and have some fun. But the, I think because everyone really pays attention to it, it feels like it's medals or you don't matter, right? It's like when someone finds out you've been in the Olympics, did you get a medal, Right. I mean, have They're you been asked that a thousand times? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's like oh, well, everyone's like, yeah. Did you get a medal? Oh, well, that's still cool. You know? And you're yeah. like, oh man, it took me my whole life to get here. <laughs> and that was something that I didn't realize I was going to feel. I never looked back at my Olympics with, I don't know what the word is. I never looked back at it fondly. They were always kind of hard memories to look back on. And now that I'm older and more removed from it. I'm like, well, I mean, I did my best, but it took me a long time to get there. I forced myself after Rio. I, I knew I ran my heart out. I knew I had a, a really great race and I, I like my coaches were, they were disappointed, like visibly disappointed to the point where I was with my family and like, I felt so bad and I started to cry and my parents were like, so proud and what's going on and it's like well fuck that like I just ran my heart out and I'm gonna I crossed the finish line here which is was really like one of the big goals after 2012 like get yourself to the end too like make sure you have that experience and so I just made myself appreciate it and be happy and not overthink all the rest of the baggage that came with it I was like nah, I'm an Olympian which is really cool and I'm gonna wear the shit and be yeah. proud of it and you so. ran well there you ran you. really well. Thanks. Did you get your <laughs> Olympic rings tattoo? No. So 2012, there was no way. I was like, this would be embarrassing because then people will ask me questions. And then in 16, I was like, I'm definitely going to do it. I have the spot. And then I just never did it. And then now it, seemed, it would be weird if I was like, oh, I really want to celebrate that again. <laughs> I think I missed my moment. How about you? I don't think you missed your moment. No, I didn't get an Olympic rings tattoo. Um 
I just was like, again, looked back at it as like, well, I failed there. Like, why would I put that on my body? But my son has been on me for a year now, telling me he wants me to get it, telling me you should be proud. It's a big deal. And so I'm actually getting it next week. <gasps> Look at you. All these years where, later. Yeah. Where are you going like, to get it? Am I allowed to ask that? <laughs> yeah. No, you're allowed. I have I have a um, tattoo of Minnesota, which I feel like, again, I'm like, being from Minnesota represents me more than being an Olympian does. So I'm going to put it right under at priorities, put Minnesota okay. and it'll be under Minnesota. Um, but there's no way he could have talked me into it five years ago. But he's just been in my ear constantly, mom, mom, you deserve it. Like you might not think it's cool, but it's a big deal. So anyway, I'm, you could still get it because you're a lot closer to the Olympic Games than I am. And I'm going to go get it next Friday. Do you think it's a ploy? You think he's going to be like, when can I get my tattoo? Probably. He already <laughs> tells me he's going to be sleeved out. And I'm like, uh, oh, no. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Let's pump okay. the brakes there a little bit. That's um when you got to the Olympics and you got to the village and you went to the opening ceremonies, what was all of that like for you? That was awesome. I, that was when it started to feel real. And like, I was obviously nursing this pain in my groin, unfortunately, and it just helped it go away a little bit. You're like, oh, I'm among the best athletes in the world. And the reality is the percentage of the people who are who here who are going to win a medal is really small. And a lot of these people are really just happy to be here. And it's some a mentality that is so hard to have. But for my first games, I was like a tourist. You know, I was like the Olympic tourist. I'm like, it's cool. I'm just going to, I can walk around the village, even though it's kind of hard on my leg. Um, I can eat all the food, mingle with people. And it helped me like not sulk too. I can experience this in a way that um, maybe if I make it back and have a more serious attempt that. I would stay away from. So that was a plus side. And then opening ceremony was cool. That just like walking into a stadium and being in the middle of the thing you watched on TV as a kid that made you dream of getting there. It's like very gratifying. Yeah. Explain, yeah. explain the experience of the opening ceremony, because I think people will be so fascinated by I mean, and it's different at every games, but I think Beijing is an awesome story. Just the so behind I, the scenes. That's the, I didn't go in London, but I did go in Beijing and it was so hot. And we had these suits, right? Like a sport coat with a shirt. And we went to this gymnasium and waited for hours. They had us by country. Then they brought us into this other room and we waited. This was just the track and field people. And we waited and then they brought in the dream team, <laughs> which now seems so funny. Like, oh, you guys are at the Olympics, the highest thing, but guess who you get to meet? You get to meet Kobe and LeBron and all these people. So I got pictures with a bunch of people from the dream team. And then they brought in President Bush, President Bush Sr. and his wife came through. And this will make me laugh for the rest of my life, but they were very clear on there are no photographs. They're going to come in. They're going to stand with the track team and they're going to leave. And no one is to ask them for a photograph. And I'm thinking like, oh man, I really wish I could get a photograph of the president. So they come in and he just immediately looks at me and is like, you've got to be a distance runner. Are you a marathoner? And he comes over and I got my picture that I wanted. <laughs> and then he was like, oh dad, my dad will want to meet So then I got a picture with his dad. And then he introduced me to Laura. So I got a picture with all three and I could feel the eyes of everyone else like, what is this happening? <laughs> yeah, it's just it's such a pain in the ass. Um, but it just so felt fun. exciting and big, right? Like no matter where you stand politically, it was like, just, this is a big deal. Um, but then we went and walked out on the track and Des, it was so freaking hot. Like I have pictures of us all with our jackets off and you can see our bras. <laughs> I mean, like through the shirt, we're completely sweated through. And then, and this is not as glamorous, but people were just pissing everywhere. You know, it's been hours and hours. No one's been able to go to the bathroom. I remember Dathan Ritzenheim brought like a bag because he had experienced this in Athens. So he brought like a bag that you peed into, which solidified your pee. I mean, it was like <laughs> bonkers, you know, but yeah. the moment that I had dreamt of my whole life was seeing that torch be lit in person and seeing that I really felt like, wow, I, I made it, you know, I like really, really made it. And it was an exhausting experience, but one, I still, I do still treasure that experience. 
That was a good torch too. Who who that was a good did the lighting? Do you remember? The, there was a it was a gymnast. I can't I won't be able to say his name, but a Chinese gymnast, and he ran around the outside of the stadium or the the top of it inside, and it was like obviously he was suspended by ropes, but it was just cool. And I, you know, back then we didn't, I didn't have an iPhone or anything. So I'm like holding this little camera that Adam gave me, <laughs> this video camera that I was held for seven hours or whatever. It was like seven hours from the time we left the village to the time I'm getting this video. And you can't see anything because the quality is terrible. And I'm like, there, I'm like crying and I'm like, there it is, there it is. And it's like a tiny little speck off <laughs> in the distance. <laughs> How often oh, do you rewatch that footage? <laughs> oh, not at all. I think that Adam and I, you know, I showed it to Adam and he was like, I can't see anything. And then that was that. I should make Cole watch it, but I, I've watched it probably like twice. Um, I don't even know what's all is on there, honestly, but it just felt that was probably the happiest part of my Olympic experience was the opening ceremonies. Did you, did you stay at the village at all or did you guys stay off site? I did um, for track until I got really overwhelmed. And then I actually left and stayed in a hotel that Alberto and Adam were at. And then in 2012, um, Shalane was like, I'm, I'm staying by the start line. And I was like, oh, well, then I'll do that too. So I didn't even, I went to the village in London just to go get my stuff, just to get my gear and then brought it back, which... I, I don't regret that. I do wish I would have stayed and had done closing ceremonies, but I was thinking like, well, I'll go in Rio. Like I, you know, I just was like, my family is here. My son, I need to spend time with him. We were going to Croatia. I was like, I'll do closing in Rio when I'm, when I'm retiring. Cause I thought Rio would be my swan song. So I am a little sad that I never participated in closing ceremonies. Did you do closing Which, ceremonies? I did not do London. Um, I did Rio. But what's pretty crazy is, and I don't know if it's like audacious or maybe arrogant or what it is, but that a lot of athletes are like, I can't do it. <laughs> like, this is so important that I can't be on my feet for that long or it's too hot or, you know, I just don't want to get there early enough for the opening ceremony. So it's like shows you the different ends of the spectrum of how people are participating in this event where some are like, nope, not risking my event. Um, and others are like, well, of course, and I'm going to get there early. <laughs> like, Yeah. Well, that was for Beijing. I was like, no one could talk me out of it. I was doing that opening ceremony. But for London, my coach at the time, Jerry Schumacher, was like, you're going to have eight hours on your feet like a week before you're going to run this race that you've trained so hard for. And I mean, yeah, I was like, you're right. I, I'm not going to do it. And I don't, I don't necessarily regret that. I just wish I had stuck around and had a little fun at the end. Yeah, I feel like one of the big questions is always what's the village like and it's that was one of the most fascinating things to me like guessing what sport people are from you're like these are all the best of the best like what is that body type for it's just a fascinating thing and like seeing everyone in the same dining hall and yes just trying tell to us understand. about that tell us about the dining hall and all of the food and yeah talk, tell us about what that's like yeah, I think I don't remem remember London that well. I know there was just a lot of like little kiosks of like random stuff, like coffee shops and like grab and go food. Um, I think I left a lot and ate outside with like Ryan or my coaches. And then in Rio, we were so far away from everything that you just had to be um, going to the cafeteria there. Like if you wanted to go watch another event, it was going to be like, I actually tried to do that once, and then I was like, I'm just going to stay out here for three days and buy new clothes. Um, <laughs> so in in Rio, I the dining halls, it's like massive. There's like m multiple wings and then just different cuisine, like every style you can think of. Um, and then it's like a cafeteria. But what's super different is, sounds so spoiled, but like the walk to get everywhere when you're in the village like it would be I don't know maybe a half mile less than that maybe a quarter mile to get to your meal so you're doing breakfast lunch dinner both directions like all of a sudden you're like I have extra mileage this is like right I don't know if other teams bring like scooters or bikes or what but um for the next generation consider that 
Yeah, seriously. And or if you, heaven forbid, you needed to do laundry or something, like I couldn't find anything. I felt like, well, you know me. I'm not good with technology, but I'm also not, not necessarily good with like directions. <laughs> So or, I felt like I couldn't find anything. <laughs> yeah, or asking for help. I knew where the dining hall was and I could find the dining hall. But yeah, I mean, they gave us a speech on like where laundry is and where internet, like where you can go get internet. Like this was 08. So they we didn't have internet in our actual dorm rooms. You had to go to a different mm-hmm. place to go have the internet access. And I was just like, what? And I remember I went one night. I really wanted to email Adam and my mom and I couldn't get my internet working. And I'm so weird that I just closed up shop and left. I never asked like, I can't get connected to the internet. Can someone help me? But the food blew my mind. And one thing I thought was funny in Beijing was there was a McDonald's in the dining hall and then like every kind of food you could ever think, right? Um, and And the line at McDonald's got longer every day because it's like people were getting eliminated from their events. And then they were like, oh, well, now I can eat this, you know? And so that that always sticks out to me that Galen and I were laughing about how the line just, it just kept growing as the games went on. And then also we had this little fob and they had, I'm sure this is how it was in London and Rio too, but they had all of these basically like vending machines all over. And you just would do, scroll your little fob over it and then you could get like a water or a Coke or whatever the sports drink is of the Olympics. I'm not sure. Is it Powerade? The branded Gatorade? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Whatever it is. But I, I thought that was super cool. Like I was like, oh, I'm just going to swipe my fob and get a water and a Coke here. Like, why would I be drinking Coke? I'm at the Olympics, but whatever. You know, I <laughs> right. can. It's I can free. get it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's totally free. The access. You want one? Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so wait, did, was there a fob vendor for this is, everyone's going to ask this or want to know, but like the condoms. Apparently they go through oh. a million. It was like a fob for that or did you just like a bowl or? There was just a bowl that I remember. Yeah. As yeah. you entered the the um, different dorms. But, you know, I'm going to be honest. I wasn't I wasn't getting it on with anybody. So I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't on the prowl for condoms. <laughs> I feel like people are more intrigued by it than anything. They're like, I should probably take six of these because they look like <laughs> something I should have six of, you know, like. Did you come back from the Olympics with all, like, that's one thing, like, we get so much stuff. There is so much stuff. And I remember I had this box of Band-Aids from the Beijing Olympics that I had kept the whole time with mascots on them. And it was when I had moved back to Boulder, it was in our second rental. I was, it was before the Olympic trials and I was doing something downstairs and I'm, I'm Colt was little, like four years old. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, nothing. And then I go upstairs and he had put the band-aids all over his <laughs> face. And I was like, oh my God, the band-aids. And then I was like, wait, why am I freaking out about the band-aids? <laughs> they got used. This is actually good. They got used. But what did you, for? but you get so much random stuff. Did you keep all that stuff? Did you give it away? What did you do with all your stuff? I gave a good amount away, especially for London. Um, in London, I don't know if you had this experience. Maybe they were like, You're you suck, so we're just gonna give you really random sizes. But like I had this crazy array of sizes and like you do the processing and get fitted for stuff and the whole thing. Um, nothing fit. <laughs> I was like, Oh, maybe they're just like this is the B team. Um, so I gave a lot of it away to people who it would fit and then I have the story in my book where Sonia Richard Ross got this like extra large podium jacket. It was the saddest thing. She was so disappointed. She's like, I have to wear this on the podium. And I had somehow gotten a medium. And I was like, I'm probably not going to be on the podium. You can have it. And she, and then she made the podium. Yeah, like, she, she did. She looked great. I love that little, <laughs> that little story so in your book. So she for 08. <laughs> oh, she will. We'll make her remember it. Um, in 08, I went to California first and then basically got like a shopping cart and then went through this huge warehouse and like grabbed everything. And a lot of the sizes had, were already taken. So I just hmm. ended up with a lot of larges or mediums or whatever, or trying to fit in an extra small, which I'm not. For London, you got hosed because I didn't even go to the village. I went to the village to get my suitcase of stuff and it had all the right sizes in there. So you got hosed. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably good. I don't need a lot of Nike stuff, to be honest. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, tell me about it. I'm like, why do I? I? So do you have 
So the, I mean, it's hard to describe how much stuff you get. You get like two giant bags and one you just immediately ship home or whatever. I, or at least in Beijing, they would ship it home from the place in San Francisco before we flew over. But there's a ton of Ralph Lauren stuff. There's a ton of Nike stuff. There's your uniform. It's overwhelming all of this stuff. Did, did you feel, I mean, I know you said you gave a lot of stuff away, but did you feel like, well, I need to keep a lot of this because it's Olympic gear. Yeah, there was a bit of that. I mean, I have it I have it in the bag in the closet where I put it immediately when I got home. <laughs> and it's there if I ever want to see it or, you know, wear it or whatever. Um, I don't know. There's like something that feels awkward about being like I should donate this or just give it away. And the moment you do that, you're like, where's that piece from the Olympics that I'm so <laughs> proud of, right? It's like with giving anything away. Like, just donate it. You haven't thought about it in eight years. I know. But, but it does feel like a huge part of your history. You know, I Adam and I both have hanging in our garage just these bags filled with Olympic gear. And I'm like, why do we have this? I don't even know why we have this. But the thought of getting rid of it, I feel like, no, 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 I earned that. <laughs> so I, I don't I know. I, probably super cool for Colt, though. Like if like that would probably be if I were going to have a child, I'd be like, well, they'll one day want to look at this and be proud and maybe wear it or whatever. Um, yeah. I bet yeah, I should make him look at it. Although so much of it's Nike, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, not. Hey, look what you can't wear. <laughs> yeah. Brutal. Actually, I wouldn't mind if you wore the Olympic gear, right? Because it stands for something so much bigger than that, than the brand. So I would, I would be okay with that. So maybe I'll let him go through my stuff. Although, I don't know. He's not that into it right now. He thinks I'm kind of a dork. So who knows? Does he does he watch the games or nothing on there has sparked interest? Oh, he loves watching the games. He's really into it. I remember this would have been a winter Olympics and not the last one, the one before. But when it ended, he was like, well, what are we going to do now? <laughs> you know, like, What's going to entertain me now? Um, he watched all the distance races from Tokyo because it they were he and Adam were recording everything. And so he went to the world championships this summer. And it was really cool to see it through his eyes. We brought him on the night that Emma Coburn was running because she's a really good family friend of ours. And he enjoyed watching her, but he was captivated by the women's discus. Like the event. Yeah, he was totally captivated by that. And he was like sitting by Trey and I was like, hey, do you want to come over here? Like Emma's going to come on the track soon. He was like, no, I'll stay here because he was like really into what was happening there. So that's kind of fun too to see. You just never know what's going to inspire somebody, right? I, I thought it would be watching his his mom's good friend run in the Olympics, which was cool to him, but not as cool as sitting next to Trey Hardy and <laughs> watching the field events. It's tough to be. That's a tough, tough bar. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty cool. <laughs> so that's interesting. You said afterwards he was like, what's next? What are we going to watch? Because I feel like for the athletes, that's such an interesting experience as well. Like, how did you feel after? coming home. And I know there's a level of disappointment with the event and how the race played out, but like that buildup is so big and it's not just the month of preparation for the track or, you know, the three months that you put on for the marathon, it's years. Like what was the other side of that like for you? It was hard. I think in 08, one thing that was good is I had committed to the New York City Marathon And so I wallowed for about a week. I mean, it's such a weird thing because I came home and my neighbors had all decorated our garage and made all these welcome home congratulations things where I just want to go home and disappear because I feel like I let everybody down, you know? Um, But I think I wallowed for a little bit. I questioned like, you know, everything that I did over there and, but then I had to just turn around and focus. So essentially I had like a week at home And then I started marathon training. So that was good for me. It was like, okay, well, all of this disappointment I can put into training for this new adventure. I had never run a marathon before. In 2012, I wasn't as as hard on myself as I was before because during the race, you know, like I said, I was definitely fried. And not because I didn't train hard, but because I wanted it too much and I trained too much, you know. And, you know, in the moment of the race, I remember thinking, I knew a medal was slipping away. I knew it wasn't going to happen. 
And I just was trying to process like, hey, there's so many people that would love to be in your position. Just still get out there and gut out for every last step you can. And then also I, in Beijing, my mom came, but I didn't see her very much. And then in London, my sister was there and my son was there. And my husband was there. Obviously, he was in Beijing too, but my mom was there. But there was my aunt was there and Adam's stepsister was there. So Oh, and my good friends that lived across the street came. So it just felt different. Like I cried, you know, I did my shower cry like I do. I'm really good at that. But then it was like, they they were like, oh my God, there's only 10 people in the world better than you. That's crazy. Like reframing it for me. So that was, I was disappointed, but it, it didn't sting as much as the first time around. What was the aftermath like for you on both Olympics? Yeah, I think... It's so tough. I, you hear like the post Olympic depression, and I, I totally think that's real. It's just like this big emotional letdowns. Like the closest thing is like when you're a kid and it's the day after Christmas, or like yeah. when you go back to school after Christmas, you're like, oh, like what's the next thing to look forward to? Um, but if Christmas were only once every four years, <laughs> so it, it's a, it's a big letdown. Um, I think I had so much like, logistical stuff to do in 2012. Like I had to figure out what this injury was, um, who was going to, I was going to get to work on me where that was going to happen. Uh, so that was distracting enough. And, you know, I think I was so disappointed by the game's experience that it was almost a relief that it was over. I'm like, Oh, thank God it's done. Um, I can start moving forward. And then in 16, it was, kind of crushing disappointment, but then forcing myself to be proud. Um, and then I was always like forced to decide if I wanted to reinvest another four years. And before I could ever make that decision, I like, I don't know, I have this need to be a little self-destructive where I'm like, I'm just going to go out and be like a normal person and like stay up too late and drink too much. Um, and then my teeth start feeling loose and I'm like, I'm the most <laughs> unhealthy per person on the planet I need to get my shit together. And then I'm like, I need, I need to figure out this running thing. So, um, I think in, in 16, I did that for a bit and then it was like, I'm going to go to Boston and try to win that. And that's like my goal. I don't want to go to any more. Like I like wrote off the Olympics and it's hard to make three teams. It's like no one, no other female no female has done that yet um i was thinking dina but no u.s female has made three olympic marathon teams and so it's like realistically you have to be way more present in your planning and not long game like how can this get ready get me ready for the next four years and so i i think i started thinking that way um which was almost a little too aggressive like i needed to pause and recover a little bit better, but I threw myself into Boston in a big way. Um, and it went well, but it was just like, eventually that crash happens. And I don't feel like I really felt it until after Boston. And that was, you know, games, hanging out, doing stuff in the fall, getting ready for Boston. And then, you know, so several months later to, to have that crash and be like, wow, I, I don't know what I'm doing this for because now Boston's gone too. And like, what's the point? So it becomes like a, like a personal crisis. Like what, what am I doing with my life? Um, and that's yeah. always hard to wrestle with. Did you watch the movie, The Weight of Gold? I don't think I did. It has like Michael Phelps is in it and Lolo Jones is in it. You should watch it. Everyone should watch it because they talk about even the people that win gold medals, there's this coming down period. You know, it's something that all of us knew about since we were a child. And then the media cycle just feeds it so much. And it's really interesting to hear these athletes speak that were extremely successful and hear them talk about the Olymp post-Olympic letdown. So there's something there about just how much pressure is around it in your life building up to it, that day that you have to actually go and perform and make the team. And then and then the actual event itself. It's just a lot. And I, I really appreciated that film because I felt, I felt like, wow, I thought it was crazy that I went to the Olympics and felt depressed. But actually, <laughs> a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I'll check that out because it's, I think it's very, very common, which is odd. And it's a thing that is being talked about much more, but 
you know, it's, it is the lights go off and it's like, they're ripping down the, you know, branding as you're going to the airport and you're like, Oh, it's over. Now what, yeah. now what do I do with myself? Um, what, okay. So upside, what would you say makes it all worth it? Like, why is it worth it oh, to invest in the career? Yeah. And- I'd rather be an Olympian and have experienced disappointment than not have gotten there. Right. I mean, kind of like you said earlier, I just wanted to know how far I could take running. I I knew I wasn't the most talented athlete that ever graced the face of the earth. And we've talked about this. You know, I I won a medal at the world championships, but everyone made excuses for why I had medaled that day because it was hot and the favorites faltered. And I knew that I wasn't the best, but I was like, well, how close can I get? And can I achieve these other things? And how far can I take it? And it's so awesome that I was able to do that. I'm so happy I was able to do that. And and becoming an Olympian, again, the more distance I get from it, I mean, the last Olympics I ran in were 11 years ago. So the more distance I get from it, the more proud I am of what I did do and accomplish. And, you know, it, it even though it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, it was still a lifelong dream that came true. And I'm so grateful that I had both of those experiences you know, like I'm sitting here complaining and telling you there's depression that follows afterward, but I would still do it again because it was awesome. <laughs> You're at the Olympics. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a complaint at all. I think it's fair to show the many sides to it. And just, I mean, the point is the behind the scenes and that's absolutely part of it. But I, I agree that it's hundred percent worth it. And even for, you know, we're super lucky because we get to say we're Olympians, but people who don't make it, but invest in finding out how good they can be and have the dream of calling themselves an Olympian and maybe they fall short. It's like, it's so worth it to try and achieve something big. And there's a vulnerability in it. Like you could fall short. You could find out that it just wasn't your day or wasn't your thing, but it's always worth the effort of, you know, extending yourself and seeing where you do land. And that's how I feel about the games. It was, um, rewarding to get there and then just to see how you stacked up so i need you to get that tattoo <laughs> that's, that's what you took away from this we'll see we'll see i've been th- i've been thinking about it for about a good 45 minutes right now is how am i going to get des <laughs> to get her olympic ring tattoo what do i have to do i need to be there and i need to drag you out and it needs to happen yeah i don't have any tattoos i'm like not like against them but i'm always like i feel like I won't love that in 10 years. Like maybe I should just commission art, but it's like the only thing that has stuck. So maybe we'll see. You know what? I'm not, (laughs) I I was so worried about getting tattoos too. And I got one when I turned 40 and um, I'm not saying that this is how it should be everyone, but now I just don't care. Like I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll get that. Sure. Why why not? So it is what it's true. They say once you get one, you don't stop. And I was like, whatever. I just want this tiny arrow on my wrist and, then yeah, it just keeps going. So you don't have to get one is basically what I'm saying because you'll end up with a sleeve. (laughs) You let me out the heck. (laughs) I mean, I'm still going to pressure you a little bit. You know, it's fine. We'll see. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thanks for chatting about all things Olympics and um, probably hopefully inspiring people to dream big and chase things down and, you know, understand that there's a flip side to everything. But I think it's worth it. And it sounds like you do too. A hundred percent.